Pierre, par le bétail finance. Bonjour, bonjour. 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 Bonj
And then the following week, after youth camp, will be day camp. Sandy, you'll be there. Mm -hmm. I'll be part of the youth camp, but yeah. You'll be there. But and, not so much like that. And do you know, how, how many kids are they planning for? Well, a hundred. Usually we have more, but because when we started planning this spring, you don't know about COVID, and we decided not to get quite as many in case we couldn't end up holding it. So about a hundred kids. Okay, about a hundred kids. And so what, what day do you, do you leave? Friday the 23rd, this Friday. This Friday, you both leave, mm -hmm. you both leave then. Then the following week is youth camp. Week after that is children's day camp. So we ask you to be praying for these guys. Uh, pray for their health, pray for their safety, pray for strength. Uh, pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit uh, through this time. And I always remind you, or I always say this every year when we have a team going, if you think about it, if you pray for them each night before you go to bed, that's going to be very closely around the time when they're going to be getting up. There's an eight-hour time difference. So if you pray for them right as you're going to bed or in that vicinity, you're going to be praying for them right at the beginning of, of their day. And those are long days. There's no rest stops during the day. Those are long days. And uh, we don't know how hot it is or it's going to be, obviously. But uh, pray, uh, pray for them. And, and this year, the COVID thing, yeah. just pray that there's no COVID or yeah. that, you know, it's it's low there now, but yeah. not many immunizations there, but most have had it, yeah. the COVID. But hope, pray that that won't interfere or that we, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah, this was a very, very much a matter of prayer because even just a few months ago, uh, the COVID rate was higher again in that area of Ukraine and it didn't look like day camp would be possible. Now the rate of infection has drop down. Uh, so, yeah, very much need to be prayed. Well, Joe, if you would join me, and we will pray for um, Sandy and, and David. Father, we just thank you again that in your great kindness and goodness to us, that you have been faithful over these many years to sustain this ministry, this connection, this partnership with the church in Smila. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. We thank you for your working there. And Lord, as Sandy and David go, we ask your blessing upon them. We commit them to your care. We commission them to go as representatives of, of South by Sandy. And we ask, Father, that you would enable them by your spirit, give them strength. We pray a hedge of protection around them in their travels and their time there. And in the enablement and, the, and in the filling of the Holy Spirit, Father, may you use each of them to encourage, to build up, to further your kingdom. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing I want to mention, um, some of you know um, this Max that had me brought over here twice who had heart surgery. He's 18 now, and we brought him over. Our church supported it. He had surgery in Michigan twice, um, and he's doing well. So, so many of you know, have met his mom, and if you've been to Ukraine, you've met his mom and dad and family. But Tanya, his mom, makes jewelry, and you remember us selling that here in church for them to raise a little money. They have very low income. She sells flowers, that's about it, in Ukraine. And there was some leftover jewelry that we kind of put aside during COVID, and, and now I'm gonna probably bring that rest back to the her. Um, but Elaine, for, because I probably won't be a fellowship, Elaine's going to be down there with that jewelry if anyone would like to buy any more, and I can bring a little bit more back to them. Um, Elaine Beckman will be downstairs with that and kind of has it laid out on a table, just so you know. So. Thank you, Andy and David, for taking time out to go to your friends. And tell them I said Kvet. I think you're saying that wrong. I'm probably wrong. But <laughs> I think it means hello. But uh, it could be wrong. Okay. Shall we pray together? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for we can gather together as this worship time, Lord. We lift up the whole congregation to you, those that are here and not here, Lord. As always, we are blessed, blessed by your Holy Spirit, blessed by the words you speak to us today and the words we sing, Lord Jesus, 
with all focuses on you, Lord. And I just love that, Lord. Thank you for this time that we can be together and that we can praise you and worship you openly and freely. In Jesus' name. Would you please take your common worship insert and follow along as I read the call to worship? You could please read in the bold print. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's from Psalms 100. Let's stand together now as we lift our voices to worship the Lord in song, praising his name together with some extra helpers this morning.
our lighthouse. You may be seated. You take your insert again and follow along as I read. We preach the gospel to ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, and we have been redeemed, purchased to be part of a great eternal family. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. The good news of Christ's death and resurrection makes us forever his. So we come. We come before our gracious God, not with fear or shame, not having to pretend we are better than we are, or having to excuse ourselves. We come because we are his. Let's bow our heads now for moments of silent confession. that you love us and your grace and forgiveness is bigger than that. And we have so much to be grateful for. Lord, we surrender this time to you in our hearts and minds that our focus is glorifying you, giving you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.
What a wonderful thing for our church to confess. We confess our faith. God, you reign. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Joe mentioned at the beginning that um, next week, Joseph Jenga will be with us. Uh, he'll be here in our service, but he won't be speaking up here. He'll be sharing downstairs in our fellowship time the opportunity for you to meet and greet him if you haven't met him. And he'll be talking about the ministry in India. But I want to share for our immediate prayer and for your continued prayer uh, an urgent prayer request that Joseph sent out just early this morning. He said, Dear friend, uh, now his parents, just so you know the background, his parents are in India. Um, my father and mother are admitted to the hospital, tested positive for COVID, and he has had some family members who have died uh, of COVID. It's still uh, ravaging in, in India right now. My dad is 82, and my mom is 76. Would you pray for God's healing for them and wisdom for me, as I may have to travel to India if their health deteriorates further? At the moment, I can fly to India, but outbound flights remain suspended at least until the end of this month, or possibly remain, remain suspended further. And what he means by that is he could fly to India, but he would not be able to fly back here uh, right now. I appreciate your prayers as Krista and I plan to make decisions. Thank you. So let's just take a moment and pray for Joseph's need and his parents. Father, we come before you. We thank you that we can intercede for brothers and sisters in Christ living on the far side of this planet. But you are right there with them. They belong to you. And Father, we would ask in Jesus' name for gifts of healing to Joseph's mother and father. We pray that their health may be restored. We would pray for protection around them, and we pray that they may be delivered from, from this infection. We also pray for wisdom and guidance from your Holy Spirit to Joseph and his wife as they weigh this decision is going to India. We would pray for your health, and we would pray for your peace upon him and all his family. Now, Father, we turn to your word this morning. We come as hearers, but not hearers only. Lord, as we open your word, we thank you for the privilege to hear your word and to know that you want to speak to us. So we ask for the enablement of the Holy Spirit for the one who preaches and all of us who hear, that we may hear and receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are uh, stepping away just for today. Uh, we are stepping away from our preaching series in the Gospel of John. Um, we will be back in John next week. We are at almost the end of John, and we are looking next week in John chapter 17 at the <clears throat> what John records of, of all four Gospel writers. He is the only one who records the prayer that Jesus prayed on the night before he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. A marvelous, powerful prayer that I'm going to preach on under the heading, the greatest prayer I've ever prayed. And I'll talk about why I would give it that, that name. But we'll begin to look at that. So in preparation, let me ask you this. If you take time this week and read the 17th chapter, the entire chapter is that prayer. You'll see what Jesus says about himself, about the one to whom he's praying, and what he is praying, or whom he is praying, and what he's praying for. But today, um, we're going to start out by looking at Matthew chapter 28. There's an outline on the back of your worship insert that would be helpful for you. The text in Matthew 28 is a post-resurrection a post appearance, when Jesus again has appeared to the disciples over a, a period of several weeks, and this would be very shortly uh, before his his ascension, and he gives what we refer to as the Great Commission, our mission, as his people in this world. In Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven, in heaven, and on earth has been given to me. So we truly.
truly can say, God, you are able. Therefore, because I have this authority, therefore I'm saying to you, my disciples, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So from time to time, um, I feel like we, we need to come back to this matter of, of baptism, and so we're doing this uh, today, haven't preached on it for a couple years, and so we're coming back to the matter of, of baptism. Well, why, why baptism? Is this something we do because it's tradition? Is this something we do because, well, we're Baptists, kind of, you know, baptism is in our, our name? Um, why baptism? What, what does it mean to be baptized and not understand why you're being baptized is, is of no value whatsoever? What does it mean? Uh, how is it done? So to start off with, I'm just going to show you uh, three photos of some uh, baptisms we've had over the past few years. Uh, this is our beautiful granddaughter, Anna. And uh, she was baptized back in, was it 2017? 2017. And it was not in the summer. We do most of our baptisms in the summer at the lake, uh, at Lake Fanny, which we're going to be doing next month. But this was in the fall, and so we used the baptistry up at the North High Sandy Baptist Church. So I'm about to baptize uh, Anna, and this is Melena Olson, who was also baptized there, two, two uh, teenagers, and were baptized both in the fall of 2017. And then one more, This I keep it in the family. <laughs> uh, this is granddaughter uh, uh, Maria. Uh, and uh, she's a little taller, actually, than she was then. But this is granddaughter Maria, along with her dad, uh, Joe, and we are baptizing Maria in Lake Fanny, where we will be uh, next month. So this is this is what, it, if you haven't been to a baptism, this is kind of what it looks like. We, you know, we're out there in in the water. All right. So as I said, from time to time we revisit the Biblical New Testament teaching on baptism. Uh, some who are new believers, some who are new believers who may be here today or may be watching us, uh, some new believers need to know about this. And others, perhaps, who have been believers for a long time and have been baptized a long time ago need to be reminded. Or there may be some who are believers, and you've been a believer for quite some time, but you've never followed the Lord in baptism. So this is for all three categories of, of people. Just one preliminary matter I want to touch on before we actually look at the scripture that we're going to be examining. Uh, baptism is, is something uh, among which Christians hold differing views. Well, that's just a fact. Um, and among evangelical Christians, among Bible-believing Christians who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and among whom we share almost everything in common, yet there are differences on uh, baptism. Some evangelical Christians practice infant uh, baptism. We do not. And the, the reason for that will be, I think, obvious as, as we proceed. But they practice infant baptism. Now, among those who practice infant baptism, which is usually by sprinkling, it has different meaning in different groups. There's a different meaning to infant baptism if, if, you, uh, if you come from a Lutheran background or in the Lutheran church versus a Presbyterian church where they also practice infant baptism or certainly from the Roman Catholic church. I think about in my own life, as I look at my life over the past uh, 30, 40 years, probably the people who have spoken most significantly into my life in terms of their writing and their preaching and their teaching that has built me up as a Christian, people who have probably done more to shape and help me understand uh, the theology of the Bible, quite honestly, are Presbyterians. But as much as I appreciate just about everything about them, I, I can't accept their view of, of baptism and why they baptize uh, infants. And I'm not going to get into that. That's, that's, that's not... That's not the point. 
Uh, my task today is not to define the differences. If you have the internet, all you have to do is Google it, right? Just go in there, put Lutheran belief about baptism, Presbyterian belief about baptism, Reformed belief about baptism, Roman Catholic belief about baptism. You, you can do that. Um, my task is not to define the differences or to attempt others, or to attempt to correct others. My goal is to set forth in a clear way what we believe and why we believe it. In the New Testament, baptism is the initial sign that marks a person as a follower of Jesus. The initial sign that marks a believer as a follower of Jesus. Now we see this in, in the text in Matthew 18 where Jesus actually gives to the disciples, there, there, there's one command, there's one command, and then there's two things that come under that command, or modify that command. The command is, make disciples of all nations. It's literally, disciple all nations. Make disciples of all nations. That's the command. All nations, everywhere, go out. Still in effect, still the Great Commission. Make disciples. And then of those disciples, he says, baptize them. Those who have become my disciples, baptize them and teach them. So we call this the initial sign that marks a person as a follower of Jesus. A sign, a sign in the New Testament is something that points to a reality that is greater than itself. So, for example, in the Gospel of John, which we've been going through, uh, in the Gospel of John, we find seven miracles that Jesus performed that, that John focuses on. The first miracle that John gives us is when Jesus turns the water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana. The last, the seventh sign that he focuses on is the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. And in between there are five other miracles that Jesus performed. The healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, the healing of the, the blind man, etc. But John uniquely refers to these miracles of Jesus as signs. He talks about these as signs that are given to help us to believe. He calls them signs because what he's saying is when Jesus did this miracle... What, the, what that serves for, what that miracle serves as a sign pointing to something greater than itself. So Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. That's a great miracle. That's exciting. But what is the sign that it's pointing to? Jesus, the reality of who he is. God in the flesh. So in the New Testament, a sign points to something greater than itself. So the act of baptism points to something that is greater than itself. A very simple, common illustration I can give you. How, how many of you are wearing one of these on your hand, your left hand? Yeah, yeah, I've got a number of them. If you're a single person, you're not, I hope, wearing one. Uh, you got a wedding ring. A, a, a wedding band is a sign that points to something greater than itself. So what I mean with people for baptism, and we're talking about baptism, I often say baptism is to a believer what a wedding ring is uh, to you in, in your marriage. It's a sign of something. Now, anybody, there's no law that prohibits you, anybody, you can be a single person, you go out to a jewelry store, right? You go out to a jewelry store, you can buy one of these and put it on your left hand. There's no law that says you can't do that. But you're lying. <laughs> you're lying about your status, but it's not illegal. But what is the meaning of that? What, what, what kind of meaning does that have? If you put one of these on your left hand and you're not married, what kind of meaning does it have? Absolutely nothing, except you're not a truthful person. But it has no meaning. That's the point. So for a person to be baptized who doesn't understand why they're being baptized, that's like putting on a wedding ring when, when you're not married. And so I always say to people, as we're talking about getting baptized, I always say to them, if, if you've not come to personal faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you get baptized, what does it mean? It just means one thing. You got wet. That's all it means. It's as meaningless as a single person putting on a wedding band. 
So it is an initial sign that marks the person as a follower of Jesus. Baptism stands at the intersection of the gospel and discipleship. Now this is really an important point. When we get done going through the Gospel of John, we're going to go into an extended look at this very thing, the relationship of the Gospel. What is the Gospel? How does the Gospel impact our discipleship, our following Jesus? But baptism stands at the intersection of the Gospel and discipleship. Because you can't, you can't be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, until you come to personal faith in Jesus. And coming to personal faith in Jesus means believing the gospel message of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross for you and that he rose from the grave. So before you can be a disciple, you have to be a believer in the gospel, come to personal faith in Jesus. And having done that, then you can begin that life of following him. So baptism stands, very importantly, baptism stands at that, that intersection, that intersection of the gospel, which is the message of salvation, and discipleship, which is following Jesus. Very, very important. And we'll see more as, of this as we go on. So if baptism is a sign that marks one as a follower of Jesus, what is it pointing to? And I hope, I hope for us to see three things that it, it is pointing to. First of all, baptism is our initial sign of believing. Our initial sign of believing. In the New Testament, this is very important, in the New Testament, people are baptized upon a confession of faith. So sometimes theologians refer to that as credo-baptism, coming from creed, I, I believe. In the New Testament, people are baptized upon a confession of faith. There is there is no other example. There is no other example in the New Testament. Now, if you look with me over to Acts chapter 2, we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of the church, literally the beginning on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came, as Jesus promised, told the disciples, wait in Jerusalem until he who has promised comes, and he will empower you. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, he filled the believers, and they were empowered to speak, and they spoke boldly to a crowd of thousands of people. And the chief person speaking was Peter. This is the same Peter who just weeks before towered in fear in a courtyard when a little Jewish maiden confronted him and accused him of being one of Jesus' followers, and he, he wilted, right? He wilted, and he denied knowing Jesus three times. Now, after the resurrection, knowing that Christ is alive, and now having just been filled with the Spirit, Peter stands before a crowd of people and boldly proclaims Jesus Christ. And the conclusion of his sermon was this, Acts 2.36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. We just talked about that a few weeks ago, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent, which means change your mind. You haven't believed in Jesus. Change your mind about him. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness or on account of the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, we see this immediately. This begins something, and, and we see it immediately. These people are baptized upon a confession of faith. The statement in verse 28 or 38 is somewhat troubling to many people, where Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. 
But the better translation of the word for there is because of, and that aligns with the teaching of the apostles that we see later, be baptized because your sins have been forgiven. And so they did. In the early church, and the first 40 years of the early church is what we have in the book of Acts. In the early church, they clearly saw baptism as following belief, following a confession of faith, which is why oftentimes our practice of baptism is referred to as believer's baptism. What began in Acts 2 becomes a pattern, and you can, you can trace this, you can walk through the book of Acts, which covers several decades, as I said, about uh, four decades, and you can see the pattern that goes through the book of Acts, and I just want to show you just a, a few examples. If you jump over to Acts chapter 8, at this point the believers in Jerusalem have been scattered out of Jerusalem uh, because of, uh, because of uh, persecution, and they've gone out to, to various places. One of them was actually a deacon from the Jerusalem church named Philip, uh, went to Samaria, and he brought the message of the gospel. And you just drop into verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Notice, when they believed, when they believed the good news, uh, then they were baptized. If you go on a little farther, you go down to verse 30, Philip was directed to go up to the chariot of an Ethiopian official. An Ethiopian who was a worshiper of the God of Israel had come to Jerusalem and was returning back to Ethiopia. And Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch, he, he, he was a eunuch, he was a castrated man. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. All taken from what we know as Isaiah 53. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And this is marvelous. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. He proclaimed the news about Christ, who he is, what, what he came to do, about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is, back, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? Then we read, then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip uh, baptized him. There are many other examples, just quickly, one more in Acts chapter 18. And we're going down in, in, in time farther. Now um, uh, the Apostle Paul has brought the gospel into Europe, into Greece, and he is in, he is in the Greek city of Corinth. And he has preached the gospel in a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, and in a neighboring house. And we read in Acts 18, 7, that Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. He's a Greek, but he worships the God of Israel. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. So this is the pattern, and there is no exception to it. We, we find people hearing the good news of the gospel. And among those who hear the gospel, there are some who receive it into their lives. They turn from their unbelief and from their paganism, and they turn to Christ, and they receive him into their life by faith as Lord and Savior. And then they give confession of that faith in believers' baptism. So baptism is a confession of faith in the gospel. The act of baptism is a person, a man or a woman, or a young person saying, I believe, I trust in, and I rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Baptism is an act that says, 
I believe that. The gospel, which Paul summarizes in 1 Corinthians 15, is saying the gospel message that I brought to you is that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried, that he rose again, and by this gospel you are saved. So when a person is baptized, they are proclaiming, I believe that. And also, if you think about it, the very act of baptism also reminds me that I cannot save myself. You do not baptize yourself. I cannot save myself. So baptism is our initial sign of believing. Secondly, baptism is our initial sign of belonging. Our initial sign of belonging. So you go back to Acts chapter 2, and what Luke describes, what happened on the day of Pentecost, again, verse 41, verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 were added to their number. <coughs> what number? Well, the number of disciples. And the number of those who were, who were part of the church. So... Baptism proclaims, I am part of the church. I am part of the people of God. And you go on into the very, uh, farther into that chapter, and there you have that marvelous section, that marvelous paragraph of verses 42 through 47 that describes the life of the early church. What was the life of the early church like? And Luke tells us that they were committed to one another. So the local church is what he's describing, a local body of believers. And these are now people who have been saved, and they've confessed Christ in baptism, and now they're doing life together, and they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, and they continue to, to meet together, and they praise God, and God adds to their number. Baptism proclaims, I'm part of the church. I'm part of the church. Baptism identifies a person with God's people. You see, when I am baptized, I am saying, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. The Apostle Peter, writing to predominantly Gentile believers, in 1 Peter 2, verse 10, he says, once, once you were not the people of God, but now you are the people. When a person follows the Lord in baptism, he's not doing that as an isolated individual. He's doing that, identifying himself with the body of Christ, with the church, with the body of believers. And I just want to say that throughout history, from the first century on, very much today in, in the 21st century, this public witness, this confession of faith in baptism has often been costly. Many have paid a great price of Christ in baptism. Many have paid a great price. I've shared this story before, but we had a dear brother in uh, Ukraine, uh, Valentin. We met him the first time we ever went to Ukraine. He's a deacon. He's gone to be with the Lord now. Wonderful, sweet man. But he shared his testimony with us. He was not a believer in, in, in Christ. He came to faith in Christ. He was a student at a university in Cherkasy. And it was a time of, uh, a rather intense time of persecution in the uh, late 70s or early 80s there in Ukraine, the Soviet Union. And so he was baptized, but they had to do it in secret. He was baptized at midnight, taken out to the river. But somehow word got back, word got around to the university. And one day he was called into the director, the director of the university's office. Valentin was called in. And the director of the university says, I heard a report that you've been baptized. Is that true? He said, yes. He said, well, then you have a choice. You can continue to attend this university, or you can be one of those Christians, but you can't be both. You can't be both. So his choice was to follow Christ. It was costly but not nearly as costly as it is for some believers in different parts of the world. For some believers, to confess Christ in baptism will mean being ostracized completely from your family, kicked out, disowned. For some, it may mean death. 
And that is happening today in our world. But when, when a man or woman stands in the waters of baptism and says, I belong to Christ and I am part of his people, that is a powerful confession. That is a confession to the world. And then thirdly, baptism is our initial sign of becoming. Becoming. Baptism is a testimony to a new life. Who, who am I now? Who am I now? Is a testimony to a new life. Now, in Romans chapter 6, this is what Paul is referring to. And again, we're not going to take, we don't have the time to, towards our purpose to really uh, examine carefully this text. But basically what's happened is in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul has set forth the reality of the, the grace of God. That God's grace, he's writing to these now Christians in Rome, he says, God's grace has been greater than your sin. You have been saved by grace through faith, absolutely apart from anything that you, you have done. You've been given the gift of God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he's answering sort of a hypothetical question in verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may, may increase? Kind of a hy hypothetical question. So if I'm saved by grace, and grace is greater than my sin, then should I just sin all I want? Because God's grace is always going to be there to cover it up. That, that's kind of the objection he's answering. Kind of faulty thinking. Well, his response is swift. By no means. Or God forbid. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So very simply, what is Paul doing? He's, he's answering that question, that objection, by saying, Do you remember what happened when you were baptized? You were buried in water. Signify what? That, that, that you have died, you have participated in, in, in Christ's death. And that is a, and he is put to death, he is put to death by the gospel. He is put to death your old life. And when you were raised up out of the water, you were picturing Christ's resurrection, but you were also picturing, Paul says there, your newness of life. It's not that baptism gave you life. But in your baptism, you were picturing, you were picturing in this act, you were picturing that you have died through the gospel, you have died to an old life, what you were before Christ, and you've been raised to a new life. In baptism, you are proclaiming you have a new identity. I am not who I once was. Baptism symbolizes the death of an old life and the beginning of a new life. It is a testimony to the truth of 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. There's a pastor in Texas who tells the story of a, a, a businessman in the community. He was well known. He's a businessman. He's kind of known as a very, uh, kind of a braggart and a very, you know, boastful kind of guy. Uh, prided himself on his self-sufficiency and everything. We started attending church, and over the course of time, he became convicted of his need for Christ, and he received Jesus into his life as Lord and Savior, and he wanted to follow the Lord in baptism. And so the pastor says, okay, we're going to set up this baptism for you. And the guy comes, and he shows up, and he's got his three-piece business suit on. He's got this three-piece business suit on. And the pastor says, well, you're going to want to change out of that. He says, no, I'm not. He says, yeah, you're going to want to change out of that because you go in the water in that three-piece suit, you know, it's going to ruin your suit. He said, that's exactly what I want it to do. Because he said, this, this suit represents what I've been. It represents my pride. It represents my arrogance. So I want to go in the water wearing this suit. I want that suit to be ruined. I'm never going to wear it. Well, he got it right. He, he got it right. You see, baptism is a sign of becoming. It's not, it's not a proclamation of perfection. A person who's baptized is not saying, hey, I've, I've arrived. You know, I'm on, a, I'm on a higher place. 
Of anybody else? No, baptism proclaims, I have begun, I have begun a new journey. I have begun a new journey with Jesus. So baptism is that initial sign of discipleship, a sign of believing. It is an outward confession of faith in the gospel. It is a sign of becoming. I am now one of God's people. I am part of the church, and it is a sign of becoming. Now, just a word about the how of baptism. Um, we practice immersion. Um, I don't think fundamentally the most important issue is the amount of water, but I am going to talk about why we practice immersion, why we do that. First of all, two reasons. The word baptism in our English Bible is a word that is a what's called a transliteration, where you take a Greek word, you simply change it to English letters. So the word baptism that we have in English is a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo. And every New Testament scholar, doesn't matter what denomination, group, what, whatever it is, everyone knows that the word baptizo means to immerse or to dip under. Um, and all historians agree, all church historians agree that that was the practice of the early church for several centuries. So first of all, we practice immersion because it's what the word literally means. Secondly, we practice immersion because of what baptism pictures. It is a, it is a picture in water, it is a picture in water of death, burial, and resurrection. It is an acted out picture of death, burial, and resurrection. First of all, proclaiming faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And secondly, saying, because of that death, burial, and resurrection, I am dying to an old life, and I am beginning a, a new life. In baptism, we bear our witness to our believing, to our belonging, you are becoming. Now there's only one question then that remains for the person who is a follower of Christ, maybe thinking about should I be baptized or not, um, the question before us is why? Why should I be baptized? Well, a person should not be baptized because mom or dad or their spouse <coughs> thinks they ought to. A person should not be baptized because all their friends are doing it. A person, a person should not be baptized be, uh, because they think that by being baptized they're gaining a little bit extra insurance, you know? Yeah, I put my faith in Jesus and I received him as my Lord and Savior, but I just want that little extra insurance, you know, another kind of added fire insurance policy here. I actually had a person say that to me one time about why I want to be baptized. Well, you know, I just think it's probably not a bad idea to have a little more insurance. You know, we've got to talk about what the basis of assurance is, okay? Those are not the reasons at all. The only, listen, the only true and biblical answer as to why you should be baptized is because, as a believer, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to obey him. And Jesus gave this command, make disciples, baptize and I want to be baptized because I love the Lord Jesus Christ and I want to obey him. And we just saw just a few weeks ago Jesus' statement in John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. So you should be baptized if you've received Christ as Lord and Savior in your life. You should be baptized for one reason, because you love the Lord Jesus, you want to obey his command, you want to make this testimony, you want to identify with the gospel and with his people, you want to bear witness to him. If this uh, message has raised some questions for you here, anyone, or anyone watching, I'd be very, and you'd like to chat about this, I'd be very happy to talk with you personally and privately about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that through the gospel, the good news of Christ, that we do become new creatures. Life changes, not because of what we've done, 
but because of what has been done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. We thank you, Father, that your Son gave us the, the, the witness and commanded those who know you to follow in this, this witness of baptism. We thank you because it is a powerful statement. We thank you for it. May those of us here today or those watching who have followed you, Lord Jesus, in baptism be reminded of what we were doing and what we were saying in that. May those who have not yet been baptized but know you as Lord and Savior and are considered, may this be a time in which uh, they are guided by your word and your spirit uh, to follow you. Let's stand together as we close this worship piece of Lord and Song and be reminded before we leave this room that it is finished, what Jesus has done for us. downstairs for some refreshments, uh, opportunity of fellowship. For those who desire to gather for our short uh, graveside service, 
for Adeline McCoy. We'll be leaving here at 1130 uh, to do that and to meet up at the cemetery. Now may we receive the Lord's benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.